Welcome to the Nelson World NCLEX content review class. Today we'll be looking at fetal development and diagnostic tests. So first of all, we'd like to start with assessment. And we'll be looking at maternal considerations and genetic considerations that could affect fetal development. When we talk about maternal considerations, we're looking at is the mother within a high risk group? What environment is she in? Are there any medications, any history of drug use or alcohol? Her nutritional status, her age. Remember, there should be no attempt at weight reduction during pregnancy. When we look at genetic consideration, we're looking at some disease conditions that are, are affect a certain populations like uh, sickle cell disease in African-Americans, um, like the Sachs disease, which is usually predominant in Northern European descendants of Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, we we'll look at thalassemia, which is usually found with people with Mediterranean ancestry. You also want to consider couples with a history of a child with a defect, family history of a structural abnormality or systemic disease that may be hereditary, closely related parents, women above 40. Here we have some genetic considerations that can affect fetal development by alteration in chromosomes. Chromosomal, chromosomal alterations, you know, may be numeric or structural. So to your left, to your left, we have uh, a Turner syndrome, which is a female with only one X chromosome. And you can see it's characterized by short stature, uh, widely spaced nipples, shortened metacarpal, small fingernails. Here, you usually see rudimentary ovaries, uh, gonadal streak, which causes most of them to be usually infertile, though there's no intellectual impairment, but it's occasionally percept perceptual problems. You also notice poor breast development, and more features, usually they do not menstruate. And to your right is a male with an extra X chromosome, which is seen in Klinefelter's syndrome. Here you could notice more of a feminized physique, poor beard growth, small testes, there's a risk for osteoporosis, usually based breast development, uh, female type pubic hair pattern and all of that. So these are genetic considerations uh, related to chromosomal alterations. Okay, we also have a Down syndrome, or also called trisomy 21. Here it is increased incidence in women over 35 years. And it's usually characterized by, you can see low set small ears, this flat occiputs, you have these epicantic folds around the eye, uh, protruding tongue. There's a single palmar crease you'll see on the fingers. Uh, there's an incurved little fingers. There's a gap between the first and second toes. Usually they have these uh, cardiac uh, defects, ventricular septal defect, patent ductus atriosus, atrial septal defect, uh, dysmorphic round face. So this is what you see in when uh, there's alteration in the chromosomes. So this also affects fetal development. Okay. We could also look at genetic considerations that can affect fetal development by defects in the autosomes or what you could refer to as autosomal defects. You know, these are defects occurring in any chromosome pair other than the sex chromosomes. So there could be 
autosomal dominant, they could be autosomal recessive, and there's also the sex linked transmission traits. If we look at this, you would notice uh, in autosomal dominant is a union of normal parent uh, with an affected parent gene. So this affected parent and this is a normal parent. Uh, the, the affected parent has a 50% chance of passing on the abnormal gene in each pregnancy. And you see this kind of uh, disease conditions in BRCA1, BRCA2 breast cancers. You see it in type two diabetes. You see it in Marfan syndrome, polycystic kidney disease. Uh, but for the autosomal recessive, it requires the transmission of the abnormal gene from both parents. You see both of them are carrier parents for expression of a disease condition in the infant or in the fetus. So autosomal recessive conditions you will see are usually stuff like uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, sickle cell disease. And then we have this sex linked transmission traits. Yeah, the trait is carried on an X chromosome, usually or a sex chromosome, usually the X chromosome. So you can see the X with the recessive uh, traits carried on it. Maybe dominant or recessive, but recessive is more prevalent. And disease conditions that are X-linked, transmitted are hemophilia, color blindness, and uh, the likes of them. Again, we can consider inborn errors of metabolism. These are conditions that can affect fetal development. And an inborn error of metabolism, these are disorders of protein, fat, or carbohydrate metabolism due to absent or a defective enzyme that generally follows a recessive pattern of inheritance. For example, one condition would be phenylketonuria or PKU. Here is a disorder due to autosomal recessive gene that creates a deficiency in the liver enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase, which metabolizes the amino acid phenylalanine. So if this is deficient, it will result in metabolites accumulating in the blood and they become toxic to brain cells. So this one in Bonero of metabolism, there's also the Tay-Sachs disease, which is an autosomal recessive trait resulting from a deficiency of Exos aminidase A, and this results in apathy and regression in motor and social development, and it also affects the eyes, usually see decreased vision. And last but not the least will be cystic fibrosis or fibrocystic disease of the pancreas. It's an autosomal recessive trait characterized by generalized involvement of exocrine glands resulting in altered viscosity of mucus secreting glands throughout the body. So you will notice all of these are autosomal recessive conditions. So let's look at some diagnostic tests that could be carried out to rule out or confirm some of these conditions that affect fetal development. So the first we'll look at is the alpha fetal protein test. You can see a blood sample usually taken from the radial artery. Uh, so the AFP test, it looks out for fetal serum protein to predict neural tube defects. It also could help to predict threatened abortion, fetal distress. And again, if you have a decreased AFP level, that suggests that the fetus could possibly have Down syndrome. Uh, usually it's done between the 16th and the 18th week. And also it's a usual concurrent test for presence of acetylcholinesterase in the fetus. Again, we also have the chorionic phyllos sampling. And you can see there's a catheter that is threaded in to take some placental tissue. So it's an early, very early antipartal test to diagnose fetal karyotype, sickle cell anemia, phenylketonuria or PKU, Down syndrome, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and it's done between the eighth and the twelfth weeks. Remember the AFT 
AFP test is done between 16th and 18th weeks, and uh, the chronic video sampling is done earlier, between 8th and 12th weeks. But remember, there could be complications like bleeding, spontaneous abortion, rupture of membranes. And again, ROH negative mother should receive rho D immune globulin after the test to prevent resus iso immunization. And you can see that in this test, an ultrasound uh, guide is used while the catheter collects sample of fet fetal placental tissue. Normally full blood is required for this procedure. Okay, and that test we'll be looking at will be amniocentesis. Here you can see uh, amniotic fluid is aspirated by a needle inserted through the abdominal and uterine wall. Again, this is also done at 16 weeks to detect genetic disorder. Possibly after 14 weeks gestation, it could also be done. When it's done at 30 weeks, it's done to assess the LS ratio. LS is your lecithin sphingomyelin ratio, which helps to determine long maturity. Prior to this procedure, the client's bladder should be emptied if greater than 20 weeks gestation. Uh, ultrasonography is used to avoid trauma from the needle to the placenta mm -hmm. and the fetus. Most times the test results take up to two to four weeks. And again, complications will also, could also arise. Some of these complications include premature labor, infection, resus isoimmunization, abruptio placenta, amniotic embolism, uh, resus negative mother should receive rod immune globulin after procedure. And again, you want to monitor the fetus electronically after the procedure and also monitor the mother for uterine contractions. Again, you want to teach the client to report decreased fetal movement, report any contractions, abdominal discomfort, fluid loss, or fever after the procedure. So let's look at ultrasound. Uh, here, a transducer on the abdomen will transmit sound waves that show fetal image on the screen. It's usually done as early as five weeks to confirm pregnancy, gestational age. It's also used to determine uh, position, number of fetuses, measurements, and other structures like the placenta. Here, clients must drink fluid prior to test to have full bladder to assist in clarity of image. No, it's, it's non-invasive with no harmful effects to mother or fetus. Again, there's also the diagnostic uh, non-stress test or the NST. Here, a transducer records fetal movements. So this will be your transducer from recording fetal movements or for sensing uterine contractions. And then there's also a Doppler ultrasound which measures fetal heart rate to assess fetal well-being, usually done after 28 weeks. Uh, client could eat snacks prior to the test. So you could see this would be the uterine contractions and this would be the fetal heart rate. Uh, a reactive non-stress test is what we need as a good finding where you have two or more fetal heart rate ac accelerations of 15 beats per minute that lasts 15 seconds over a 20 minute interval. And then there's a return to the baseline. So that would be a good finding. That's a reactive non-stress test. So they are lasting two or more fetal heart rate accelerations of 15 beats per minute, lasting 15 seconds over a 20 minute interval. That is a good finding. There's also the contraction stress test. It, this could be done by either stimulating the contractions through the nipples or IV using oxytocin stimulation. It helps to evaluate fetal response to stress of labor. Usually, again, it's performed after 28 weeks. The woman could be placed in semi fowlers or sideline position. A positive contraction test is where you see decelerations with at least 
50% of the contraction. So you can see there's late decelerations. There's a contraction, there's a late deceleration, contraction, a late deceleration. So a positive contraction test is where you see a late deceleration with at least 50% of contractions. And this tells you there's a potential risk to the fetus and caesarean section may be necessary. While a negative contraction test, a negative contraction stress test, there'll be no late decelerations with a minimum of three contractions lasting 40 to 60 seconds in a 10 minute, 10 minute period. So you could see there are no late decelerations when we have a minimum of three contractions lasting 40 to 60 seconds in a 10 minute period. So you just want to monitor for post-test labor onset after this procedure. Again, you could also look at as trial levels. Here, yeah, serial 24-hour maternal urine samples or serum specimens are collected to determine fetal placental status. Again, if you have decreasing estriol levels, it usually indicates deterioration. Again, what's our plan and implementation in avoiding uh, fetal uh, hazards that could impact fetal development? You want to advise avoidance of hazards. What kind of hazard could affect uh, the fetus? Stuff like urinary tract infection, um, lower tract infections are usually characterized by urinary frequency and urgency, dysuria, and sometimes hematuria. But uh, for upper tract infections, you usually see fever, malaise, anorexia, nausea, abdominal, and back pain. Uh, urinary tract infections are usually confirmed by a greater than 100,000 male bacterial colony count by clean catch urine. Most times they're asymptomatic and they're usually treated with sulfur-based medications and ampicillin. Again, we could also carry out the touch test series the touch test series are a group of maternal systemic infections that can be transmitted across the placenta or by ascending infection, maybe after ruptures of membrane to the fetus. Infection in early uh, pregnancy may produce significant and devastating fetal deformities, whereas later infections may result in overwhelming active systemic disease or CNS involvement causing severe neurological impairment or death of the newborn. So one of such touch uh, test series where you have T, T will be your toxoplasmosis. Okay, it's protozoal, transplacental to fetus. Uh, here you want to discourage the mother from eating undercooked meat and handling cat litter box. So we know that cat transmits this uh, infection. So you want to tell her during pregnancy, avoid handling cat litter box. And O will be others. And these others include syphilis, varicella shingles. Uh, for varicella shingles, it's also transplacental to fetus or droplets to newborn. So you want to caution susceptible women about contact with the disease and Zusta immunoglobulin for anyone who's been exposed. Uh, for group B, beta hemolytic strep streptococcus, it could be transmitted by direct or indirectly to the fetus during labor and delivery. It's usually treated with penicillin. There's also hepatitis B, which is also transplacental and contact with secretions during delivery. So you want to screen and immunize maternal carriers and treat newborn with hepatitis B immunoglobulin. Also, there's hepatitis A, which you need to encourage good hand washing techniques amongst mothers. There's also AIDS as with hepatitis. Remember, titers in newborn may be passive transfer of maternal antibodies or active antibody formation. So these are some of the disease conditions that may copy others. Uh, R would be rubella which is also transmitted transplacentally. Yeah, prenatal testing is required by law. So remember, pre prenatal testing is required by law. Caution susceptible women about contact. 
And again, rubella vaccine is not given during pregnancy. There's also the cytomegalovirus, CMV, uh, transmitted in body fluids and detected by antibody serological testing. There's also herpes 2, which is also transplanted tra Transplacental uh, ascending infection within four to six hours after rupture of membrane or contact during delivery if active lesions. Caesarean delivery, if there are active lesions, is advocated. And the last but not the least, as part of our plan and implementation, we want to teach optimal nutrition and exercise. Uh, teach and prepare for procedures, uh, teach danger signs of pregnancy. The mother needs to know if there's any gush of fluid or bleeding from the vagina, it's a danger sign of pregnancy. If she's experiencing regular uterine contractions or severe headaches, visual disturbances, abdominal pain, or having persistent vomiting, these are bad signs for pregnancy or danger signs of pregnancy. If she's having fever or chills, swelling in the face and fingers. If she notices decrease in fetal movement, these are all danger signs of pregnancy. She must report to her healthcare provider. Again, you want to teach the client to report decrease in fetal movement. And as part of your evaluation, you want to summarize and know has the client remained free of complication and is the fetus in stable condition? Does the client have sufficient knowledge of pregnancy and child beds.